Hello there, everyone, and thank you for rejoining me here in TNO, the last of your boots replying as everyone's favorite king, King Rook II. But look upon my work, standing at least six meters tall, including the pedestal, a huge statue of something to behold of. Made of the finest stone and granite in Siberia, Rook was rather flattered. The armor was quite detailed, using e every accuracy of the medieval era. It even included a few jewels and diamonds and placed carefully into the armor. Rook was quite sure it would become a, a staple piece of Camarobo for years to come. Of course, the sculptor clearly took some artistic liberties. Rook often would quite not go into battle carrying a sword while riding a horse, no matter how much he wanted to. He was also not as muscular as he was in the sculpture, but still, Rook was quite pleased. He liked how it was overly romanticized, and he had to make sure that the sculpture was well paid for his work. And if this was enough to be put up for, uh, just for the unification of Central Siberia, he wouldn't and couldn't dream of what would be put up in his armor, honor once Moscow is back in Russia's grasp. Quite impressive. If you want to read about the attack of the Roman game, please go right ahead. And we'll talk about a minor issue. Which I'm, I'm pretty sure I read it last time, but there it is. Uh, what do we want to do? Decrease IC by 1.5%. Get more stability. Not a bad idea. Royal Edicts. Uh, that's not bad. I like getting more administrative efficiency. Ooh, this one's good as well. Ooh. Repurpose the monasteries. Ooh, prisons. Reduces admin strain. Well, let's go up Royal Edicts first. Decades of poor leadership have left Russia in a sorry state. Contradicting laws, excessive bureaucracy, not to mention the ineptitude of the warlords have all played their part in confusing the new government. <clears throat> Nevertheless, King Rurik II is no stranger to monumental tasks and wishes to draft Royal Edicts. These laws will allow for the overhaul of the central bureaucracy, streamlining the Siberian administration, and hopefully pave the way for a new Russian Empire. At least that's a hope, at least. At the very least. And how many more days do we have left for this? Three days left is not bad. Currently, the economy is doing quite well. 0.55. Of course, we did change our divisions to be, like, really, really tiny militia divisions. So, just literally guys with, like, 80 guns. That's it. Huh. Not good, but we don't need that for now. We don't need that either. We're still trying to integrate Western Mongolia. We're still trying to connect, reconnect the roads in Norilsk, which would be very nice. And then we've got all this stuff, like, normal as well. As, what did we do this one? Nuclear energy technology. It takes a long time to do. I don't think we'll ever really get to there, so. But we'll see. We will definitely see. And attacks of the realm, a minor issue. And Royal Edicts. Which would be nice. And then we'll talk about repurpose of monasteries. But once we talk about a minor issue. Oh, King Rook has always had an odd relationship with the Orthodox Church. A proud atheist, he has denounced priests as charlatans, wizards. A blight upon Rush, not unlike opium. Although it is a sizable faction within the Sabor calls for the complete destruction of all the churches, temples, and organizations that undermine the king's authority. Certain nobles advocate for a more practical option. Repurposing the buildings for more useful tasks, namely, border churches will be militarized and converted into barracks, and their basements turned into arsenals, thereby making the building a village blockhouse. Temples within the safety of the kingdom can become prisons for unending streams of criminals. But a minor issue. Another day, another heated argument in Zemsky Sabor. What was once thought to be a minor issue has since escalated to become a noble verbal battlefield for the two wolves, Prince Yuri and Princess Lydia, to do battle on. <clears throat> to intrude upon the rights of the local councils will be tantamount to tyranny, no matter how small the intrusion. Oh, this is first. Yesterday may only be a rose in telephone lines, but what tomorrow? I wholeheartedly agree that the realm must be connected, but we cannot do without the express consent of the people. As always, Yuri was nothing if not passionate. His sister Lydia rolled her eyes, again with this talk of rights. Yuri, how tiresome. Perhaps we should also like to ask the ground if it would be okay for us to build on top of it. Maybe we should ensure that the God-given rights of the woodland animals aren't infringed upon either. <clears throat> Laughter could be heard among some of the council in response. Rook the second was distraught at the sight of his children arguing with each other in such a way, but did his level best to not show it. It was clear, however, that the two would not budge. Soon enough, the council would be soon, uh, looking into the king to break the deadlock. Okay, so... We'll probably go, we shall pay heed to Prince Yuri. Changing the decor. Father Kuro watched silently, his heart heavy, as the soldiers moved to pack his icons, Bibles, and other priestly items in the box present. His church had been requisitioned by the royal army for use as a command post, and had been made very clear as politely as possible that he had no choice in the matter. The common soldiers themselves had been very respectful. They were taking great care not to damage any of Kuro's religious items as they collected them, but did such little... Uh, to soften the blow. He had led this church and the small community around it for decades, doing his best to provide guidance and support to the simple yet pious people of the local villages. And now he was not sure if he would ever be permitted to return. He had heard from this fellow priest about this happening elsewhere, churches taken over by the military, who greatly valued the bell towers for observation of the cellars for protection. More than one had been destroyed by the enemy if, if and when the fighting had turned. More still, though left standing, they were returned to their one shepherds in the terrible condition. He dearly hoped that it would not be the case for him. As the soldiers finished packing and carefully stacking the boxes beside the doorway, Kuril took one last look around the now empty nave and realized how much larger it seemed when bereft of fixtures. Then he picked up the boxes, carried them to the cart that one of the local farmers had insisted he used for travel and departed. And as the bell tower of the church disappeared over the horizon, he could not lift stifle his tears. A necessary sacrifice, but they all joking, all drunken, silent, out of fools and jesters.
Deep through the Hall of Conquerors, past both woodland and farm, an emperor sat upon his steel throne, as the raging fires of the hearth and spotlight shone above the greater Tsar Rurik II. More so than the other squabblers and plotters throughout the vast Russian lands, Rurik II, known as many moons ago as a marshal of the greater Soviet Union, bearing the name Nikolai Ivanovich Krylov, <clears throat> has borne the name of conquer past these frozen lands, allowing man, woman, and child to feast upon their glories and victories they've rightly earned, just as Rurik intends to do tonight. My lord, the guests have arrived, said the captain of the guard, as the two Russian men bearing snow-laden coats walking in. One bore a steely set of glasses and a sharp mustache and goatee, whilst the others cared less for appearances, bearing grisly scars across an equally grisly unshaven face. The two Alexanders, greater than any great conqueror of Greece and greater friends than any Tsar may ask of, cried the Tsar, as he hopped down the steps and embraced the two tightly in his warm coat. And the Tsar Rurik II was joined by Alexander Svetslav and Alexander Karzatsarev for a night of hearty laughter, belly-warming drinks, and glorious stories. It was true, each of these men had to think consistently of each and every day, making plans centered around the very survival of their people, whilst the hunting poltergeist of a war long lost ago crept upon the shoulders, rousing them to an awakening each and every night as the screams of fallen comrades plagued them. But now was not such a night. No, now was a night to long for, one for laughing and loving friends. Oh, for the day where every Russian may do the same in the king of the people. A lot can be said about the Romanovs of yesteryear, that they were weak and decisive, maybe even the biggest factor that led to the failure of the Russian state, however. By far the biggest failure had been their inability to connect with their own people, King Rook. Uh, himself, having been a common man, understands the complexities of the modern age. The pleasantry are no longer illiterate masses with minimal power, but potent tools for change. Uh, King Rook wishes to establish minor welfare programs, encourages his nobles to interact with the civilian governments, guarantee property rights and safety rights, among other things. Much of Russia is still in disrepair. It's critical that the people of the land know whose side they are on. This is weird that they still have this for us. I don't understand why we still have uh, this issue here. How are they able to raid us still? I don't understand. Uh, but we're going to keep talking about install regional... Posadniks, the new curfew, which is a strain, add high income weighted, um, add reduces strain, let's do, uh, we can use more stability, lessons from the cost in China. The workers revolves left his mark in the realm, it's clear that there still exists a deep sympathy for the red cause among the people. <clears throat> Dallas, every factory has its agitator who reminds the workers of the failed union. Every village has its veteran who weaves tales of glory under the WRF. Every city has its anarchist who moves the people with false promises of freedom. No matter the king is a plan, every revolt has a spark. Be it unpopular war or unfair treatment by the government to ensure the safety of the kingdom, propaganda uh, uh, will be spread messages. We'll spread messages to calm the people. We'll show the border towns of their safety. The workers will be guaranteed a fair wage. Their armies will to be checked by the soldier. Russia cannot give another revolution or not survive another revolution. We must guard against the tide of communism. Yeah, I, I don't know about this. You know, we'll just do that. That makes it easier. Let's go back and do this. It's fine. Do we have any more of the depth? I mean, that's really weird that it still fires, but whatever. Alright. <coughs> King of the people, and then... Uh, people share. It was always a good day, the delegates sought when King Rurik was in attendance at the meeting of the Zemsky Sabor, primarily because the main decision would most likely be made, and there would not be simply an internal argument between his children. Today, they quickly found themselves uh, to be at least half correct. Rurik, after opening uh, the session and thanking all those there, announced the immediate imposition of a number of welfare-based reforms upon the state as recommended by Prince Yuri. Though Yuri was quick to stand and thank the king for the foresight he so clearly possessed, little attention was paid to him. For all eyes were upon Princess Lydia, who, as her father's announcement had progressed, had become increasingly still, a motion they had learned was always followed by an eruption, an eruption that soon followed as her voice echoed through the chamber. The very concept was inexcusable, she cried, and even by recommending it to her father in the first place, Yuri had failed in his duties. The challenges facing the state were immense as she continued passionately, and the resources were highly limited. Dividing those to social endeavors instead of the military or other security forces was not only short-sighted, it was, according to her, borderline criminal. After a short while and during a pause, Yuri calmed calmly asked his sister if she was finished. As she stared back at him, wide-eyed, he turned to King Rook, who only nodded as he looked at his daughter. And that was that. Lydia sunk back down into her chair, defeated for now, but the look of fury in her eyes was unmistakable, and all knew that this decision was not, could not be the end. Could any other response have been, have been expected? <clears throat> if you wonder about a modern opera in China, Shinina, please go right ahead. But, uh, Ruskaya Pravda. 
Prince Yerith proposed to return the Ruskaya Pravda to the kingdom, originally a legal code used by the old Rus, ensuring the health of the common folk and stabilizing feuds between the nobility. Naturally, this code would need to be brought up to the date. Stipulations include a fair work treatment, an overall local courts, police sensitivity, the abolition of capital and corporal punishment, the abolition of any existing slavery or involuntary service, increased equality between genders, equality between nationalities that can constitute the Russian kingdom, a right to free speech and assembly, provisions for landing peasants, inheritance regulations, stabilization of crown authority, and the abolition of organized religion. Organized religion. And create the really increased influence of Prince Yuri, which is already pretty high. And then, yeah, there's a strain. Peace in the kingdom? Um, yeah, why not? Or Nightgale come again. Ever since Princess Lady had been installed as the governor of Tomsk, the city's hospitals and healthcare infrastructure has been seen much needed attention. Not only has Princess Lady raised funding for hospitals and modernized much of the previous infrastructure, but a mysterious woman has appeared. This nameless woman has been aiding hospitals and tending to the wounded and sick on the street nights or the streets at night. Many citizens of Tomsk attribute <clears throat> the facts of this woman to the kind actions of some good Samaritan, but in reality, it's simply not the case. The people of Tomsk do not see behind the curtain Lydia has established. The teams of paramedics, par medical mercenaries, and patrolmen working in tandem to locate and treat those unable to reach hospitals. They do not see the many messages. Lydia sends monitoring their progress and success, and instructing them on how to more efficiently perform their jobs. The people of Tomsk remain unaware of how much effort was needed to hide all this from their eyes and all in the interest of giving them their beloved heroine. The uh, mystery remains unsolved, and the people of Tomsk seem to be content to leave it that way. Believe creates the actual fact, and for the first time in over half a century, there's a peace in Russia. It's finally beginning to dawn upon the peasants that they no longer have to be subject to famine, banditry, or looting by their own government. Women and children can safely travel between major cities. Bartering is usually being displaced by imperial coins, and notorious bandit nests have been neutralized. The clouds feel less heavy, and the workers can truly appreciate the morning breeze, confident that their workplace will spare their lives and limb. There's still the occasional complaint by some former priest, and every so often a village is awoken by the screams of a socialist being dragged off to prison, but the chaos that was the warlord era is now over, and a new age is coming. Great. And Ross is coming along nicely. Anything else we really want here? Military industrial... I mean, we want this. I definitely want projects of military, military industrial development. But anything like societal development doesn't really look like it yet. Peace in the kingdom. Which is a great thing. <clears throat> Motivations are fine. Throw them in, because you can. Um, weekly manpower goes up, which we don't really need. I like military base. A lot of military bases. We got... Good amount of stuff here already. Initiate uh, this one. Uh, increase the state GDP. How is um, production construction looking? Well, military bases are what? We could use in a couple more. Yeah. You know, I'll we'll do it anyways. Why not? What about the new culture? That guidance is the bane of civilization. As the nation grows strong, it loses the old ways, forgets its roots and ancestors. The seeds of Rush were once planted by the Kievan Rus. Uh, fading memory preserved only in liber libraries. Uh, King Rook II wishes to remedy this disaster. Though the use of mass media and government contracts with, manu with, new with manufacturers, the old will become new. Arche architectural designs will try to mimic those of the medieval age. D TVs will broadcast movies based on ancient epics. Folk music shall bloom to dominate the industry. Tales of old hags and three-headed dragons will enter the kindergarten curriculums. The noble houses will recover the flags of old. Officers shall be given ceremonial battle axes. Laws preserving the forest and the hills be put into place. The new kingdom will emulate the old one. Which is a great thing. Now we're going to keep working on poverty, of course, as well. But now we got better equipment, which is great. It's not perfect, but definitely a lot better than what it used to be. Wow, we only have one? Holy crap. And what's even worse is that now we're out of coffee. Oh, no. Embrace modernity and tradition. To the outside observer, the uh, kingdom of Siberia is a kingdom of contradictions. The ban banner of Kievan Rus is colored yet red and yellow. Former red and white officers fight side by side in the name of the king. Nobles pass laws in favor of a factory workers and participate in local elections. However, through chaos, there's order. King Rook II has achieved the unachievable. He has combined the best of both worlds. On one hand, the old communist regime's progress called militarism and state atheism. On the other, the old kingdom's national pride, loyalty, and degree of capitalism. Although many question Rook's unorthodox methods and many more labeled him a failure, the kingdom of Siberia now stands as a shining beacon of opportunity in the Siberian wasteland. But a family meeting. Prince Boris looked at his father with unease. Together, they had devised this eminent meeting between his ever feuding siblings, but as the time approached, time of it approached, he could not feel but apprehensive. Lydia was, of course, the first to enter. Early as usual, and wearing her practice expression of diligent arrogance. He could tell she had not believed the lie he had told to draw her here for an instant, but he had come nonetheless, out of respect for the father. Prince uh, Yuri arrived later. Rurik uh, quickly took control before they could begin sparring. <clears throat> oh, that looks really nice over here. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you actually lose stability and get more war support and stability. Huh? Okay. Um, 
He had asked Boris to set this up, he said, because he was tired, both personally, officially, of seeing his two more prominent children at constant violent odds. It was bad for his health, he continued, and it was very bad for the stability of the state. Together with Boris, he had, they, implored them to come to an understanding. The room was quiet for a long, long time before Lydia laughed sharply and cruelly at the moment. Boris knew they had failed. She did not come, she did not have to do anything of the sort. She said coldly, as she had done nothing wrong. She'd always acted in the best interest of the state, and Yuri needed to accept that. Yuri immediately retorted that he always acted in the interest of the people, and if she could not see that a state without his people was nothing, she did not deserve her position. The war of words continued, as Boris looked desperately at the father, who only shook his head. Another failure. Shortly thereafter, Lydia declared the entire affair was a waste of time, and stood. Yuri did the same, one of the few things she said that he could agree with her upon. They both stormed out a moment later. Boris and Rook exchanged a sigh. What else could they do? Could have ended any other way? Yeah. This would be good to do next. Quite a bit of pee, pee which is nice. Over one a day, nice. 1.7 ain't bad. Day's gonna keep going up. I wish we could get higher than the vehicle. Why do we go up to fair? Why? But it's alright. We're just gonna save our PP so we can go stay close to the resources. Infrastructure would be nice. More resources so we can trade them away, it's not bad. Ah, uh, do it anyways, we got a PP. We're a fashion. Ola clocked out of the Novos Abyss factory and prepared to head home, donning his old coat and eager, and eager to find out what his wife had prepared for dinner. Picking up some bread from the bakery, Oleg noticed some of the other customers' more interesting clothing. Women in colorful dresses and tops, men with large fuzzy hats and dark red coats with detailed patterns covering them from head to toe. It almost looked medieval, thought Oleg. Had everyone decided to copy that mad tsar? People these days are so eager to latch on to other people's fashion. Purchasing the bread, he noticed that even the store owner, Nikita, was wearing a large blue medieval-looking robe and sporting a long beard alongside it. Even you, Nikita, I thought you were a diehard Republican, spotted Oleg, surprised to see, even see him wearing the Tsar style. Ah, but the times are changing, replied Nikita. I've learned. Rurik's a great Tsar, better than any president could be. Besides, these things are comfy. I've heard this one's called a Fajaz. There's a store selling them right across the street. No thanks, I'll stick with my more modern clothing, replied Oleg as he left the store. Finally arriving at home, his wife was the first thing he saw as he walked in the door. Helena, what are you wearing? said Oleg incredulously. <clears throat> it's my new fur coat. All the women are wearing it. Noble women uh, used to wear these things back in ancient Russia. The colors on it are just gorgeous. I think I'll keep it forever, Elena said, smiling. Oleg stammered. Not knowing what to say, his wife wearing insane clothing as well. Everyone's wearing something from the medieval age. Honey, what's wrong? said Helena. You know what? You really need to get a new coat. Did you see that place near the bakery? It's some very good selection of fine men's clothing. Let's take you there tomorrow. We can get some for the kids as well. It'll be perfect. Maybe I should get with the times. But a minister in the kingdom. With the acquisition of the new lands, King Rurik II has proclaimed the role of Ministry of Internal Affairs, modeled after pre war institutions. The organization's objective will be to integrate existing institutions, foster, foster economic development and reconstruction efforts, and ensure a smooth bureaucracy. Naturally, both Yuri and Lydia will try to compete for control over the ministry. So the Tsar will have to decide which of his children to favor. Which we kind of already know. Oh, connect in Norsky Yenisi. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. Yay! We'll get more wars, which would be nice. We can manpower too. It's really hammer home industry right now, though. Mm. Nice. Keep training them. Yeah, Tino moves much faster if you just start your computer up and just only play Tino, do nothing else. Rural court. Expand the power grid. I and mean, we're still pretty good. You do get more weekly stability, which I do like. Let's do that one. Come with loyal stuff. The Tsar's new armor. To many in the crowd, the marble on stage was something almost out of an old storybook. A Tsar glistening in our iron armor, a sword sheath, but always at the ready for battle, and the most important piece of the collection, the cape with the crest of the royal family. <clears throat> but for some in the crowd, the appearance of modern-day rifles, men in old military fatigues, clashed with the appearance of the great man as he held them in marching formation. The vast majority, however, did not notice any incongruity with the current reality they had been living in. The armor had been talking of Novos Abirsk ever since Tsar Rurik II had been seen, protected by his royal guard. Uh, the local blacksmith, all citizens of the Tsardom, had speculated of specially made armors for the leader to ride off in the battle on the horseback, but no one had expected to be so authentically traditional. As he strolled through the street, his men in tanks at his back there came a moment where he stopped. He signaled to his men, and they, in confusion, did it as they were told. The Tsar mumbling something about under his breath, Called for his horse, and his whole crowd of loyal subjects watched and worried rode away without further explanation. The day afterwards, the stars gave a decree that he had a mystical experience, and wished to be left alone, as he needed time to understand and contemplate the reason for my feelings that day. The armor was never seen again. Perhaps he wasn't feeling well? But if you want to read about loyal bogars, or boyars, please go right ahead. 
bureaucrats from the Union. Prince Yuri had decided to exert his influence over prominent officials and nobles to expand the Union's power. The Ministry of Internal Affairs has only so far accepted bureaucrats with extensive connections, thus limiting public representation. The aristocrats currently command the ministry and have been focusing down their efforts on private enterprises while leaving the rural villages out to dry. By reducing application requirements, officials can be recruited from unions directly. Additionally, they will greatly expand Prince Yuri's power base <clears throat> and give him virtually complete control over administrative affairs outside of Kemerovo. Although the kingdom has its roots in social institutions, the nobility fears such as cutback on their power is further ostracizing the divide between the two siblings. But, in sole regional Posadniks, uh, Pos as a grim truth that they simply have too much land and too few nobles, although the aristocracy is able to govern population centers and production capitals, they're not enough for the smaller villages which now constitute the large part of our new kingdom. King Rurik II has decided to reinstall the old Posadnik system, absent in Russia for more than 500 years. These bureaucrats will rule eastern towns, help assimilate the local populace, and can be granted temporary leadership by nobles. These administrators will answer directly to the king, but elected from existing minor nobles or exemplary officers. Administrative grumbles. The non-royal members of the Zemsky Sabor knew the moment they entered the chamber that there was yet to be another showdown between Princess Lydia and her brother. The glowering venomous slugs that she shot across the floor were impotent enough, or portent enough. They were not disappointed. The item on the agenda concerned the recruitment restrictions <clears throat> and de desired qualifications for state bureaucrats, primarily as it concerned their social status. True to his roots, Prince Yuri favored relaxing or even eliminating them altogether, both in order to promote social advancements as well as to connect the ordinary people to the government in stronger fashion. At that, Lydia responded with her usual cutting, derisive laughter. The people, she proclaimed, were unreliable at best, and insurrectionists at worst. Bureaucrats should be handpicked from the aristocracy, she argued, in order to ensure that both they owe their, owe their loyalty to the institutions of government and were likely to have sympathies with the revolutionary elements. The debate continued as most expected. Yuri called his sister a tyrant, and she called him a fool, with the epithets only escalated from there and those in attendance, silently counting the minutes where they would once again be free, unwilling to place themselves in the line of fire. Though all, uh, including the royal siblings, knew that a decision would eventually be made by the father. Prince Yuri made a good point power to begin to prove. Oh, yes, please. Meet your new owner, Paul Zednik Dmitry Goryev looked out the window of his new office with feelings of trepidation. He had been rather excited about his election to the position, but when he arrived at the small town in the eastern reaches of the realm, he was surprised at the hostility he faced. The town folks had been distant and cold at best. As his car drove down the main street to his new residence, he had been subject to ridicule from the residents. They had thrown mud and dung at the windows, his manner was questioned, and his guards were forced to step in when a former black army militia man had thrown himself at the car with a knife in hand. He knew he had his work cut out for him. The people in the region had grown so used to the freedom given to them by the black army that it would take much to gain even the smallest amount of respect from them. They chafed under new taxes and other obligations to the kingdom that they found themselves a part of. He knew most of their discontent was idle bluster, but even then he realized that the sheer importance, stability, and contentness would bring for the time being he would have to put up with the heckling as they went about his day and find ways to endear himself and the kingdom to the people he now served. Dmitri turned back to his work and glared silently at the papers in front of him. There had been some issues with the tax numbers this past month. He hoped to do his duty to the best of his abilities, and he also hoped that the people he oversaw would come to respect him and the new government in the future. The burden of leadership is a heavy thing. As someone who vesh. King Rurik has decreed the creation of a Vesh, or council. Unlike the Zemsky subordinates' ministries, a Vesh serves, another, uh, serves advisory roles, including war planning, building layouts, and will help with a political maneuvering around other factions. The Vesh will consist of those who have proven their worth to the Tsar in the past, and hopefully those whose allegiance is to Rurik rather than the bickering heirs. The Vesh will meet off record in an undisclosed location, and therefore have no legal power, but due to its constitution, will be one of the most influential organizations in the Young Kingdom. Goodbye, Yugra. Goodbye. Bureaucrats from the unions assemble new vesh. Render under Rurik. King Rurik recognizes the struggles faced by the peasantry, but the coffers need gold. A revised tax code needs to be drafted, mints established, but ultimately, the foundation to the kingdom will come from the common man's pocket. After all, was it not Rurik who would save the Russian people from the treacherous anarchists and vile despots? All of Russia, or Siberia, really belongs to the Tsar. Every pound of gold must become uh, must be accounted for. Russia must not be allowed to be lag behind the rest of the world any longer. However, Rurik is a benevolent ruler, so taxes will be based very on on the location and circumstance. Individual enterprises must not be compromised as the new tax code understands the plight of the peasantry. Uh, mining operations, yes. Expand, expand petroleum uh, excavation, yes. A modernized freight train network? Absolutely. And anything else here? Nope. Darn it. I was hoping we get some more there. We don't really have really much in uh, surplus now, which does kind of suck, but whatever. A new bash. Not looking too bad. We did get the agriculture one, too. We're just coming along nicely. Stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, foreign instructors. Yes, please. Our people's going to go down very quickly. Unfortunately. I'm going to burn through our people like crazy, which sounds really weird. Poverty relief? Yes. And then... The class, Clash of Wolves. The inevitable has occurred. Prince Yuri and Princess Lydia have been fighting each other for years now, competing to see who would choose... 
who would be chosen as heir to the throne, and who would be given the chance to shape the future of Russia and who would be left to play second fiddle for the past few weeks. Fanatic supporters of both sides are clashing in the streets of Kemerovo, while politicians and nobles fight on, on in the civil war. King Rook II has noticed the devastation that comes with this rivalry and fears that the situation may deteriorate in a civil war. Thus, the king has decided to finally name his successor. The entire kingdom watches silently, and even outside forces are curious to see the next winner of the next ruler of all of Russia. The king's ear. Thurok sat in the uh, sat in an ornate round table with his hands folded atop it. Around him were some of the most powerful and influential men in the kingdom, was conspicuously including the two wolves. I thank you for coming, gentlemen, to for the first meeting of the newly assembled Vesh. It's my hope that this council will provide tact tactful and wise advice to the rulers of the Rus. Perhaps for the first session we can should discuss a growing discord. After a brief silence, Pyotr Baranovsky was the first to speak. It's obvious that what's causing all this discord is the two children of yours, constantly butting heads whenever they meet. You want to save the realm from splitting apart? Something must be done about them. What would you suggest we do? Their influence grows by the day, and they're already railed, rallied two very different sections of the populace to the cause. I believe we should try to nominate a successor and ride out the storm as best we can. Chemden Boros cried, love. The only other member of the royal family present. Rorik gave his son's words some thought. It was hesitant to nominate a successor, but it was becoming apparent that if it wasn't done soon, the kingdom's stability could be in jeopardy. The only issue, however, was deciding which one would eventually take the crown. Whoever decided, someone won't be happy. Ah, some, oh, Samara Unified, okay. Not bad. The divisions we will be using are these, which is 36 combo, which is not terrible. 41. And honestly, we'll probably make 42 and throw on some anti-tank as well. 42 combo is not bad. Uh, we might go with Recon, maybe we'll see. What I'm really hoping for is... Uh, planes. Not planes. Helicopters. Huh. Not quite planes. Cast, agility, attack, nice. For now, I think 24 divisions is probably good enough. I can't imagine these guys had to have even more than us. They might, but for now, we're done. We have no yearly plus, which is not good. But whatever. Clash of Wolves. Anything else here? Nope. Alright. And then we'll start doing the economy, so the foundations of the kingdom. The once arriving heart of the uh, Russian industry is now under the watchful eye of Rook II. But the sad truth is that the heart no longer beats. Years of strife and warlord conflict have. <clears throat> Rendered vast swaths of the region in shambles, and many of the factories are in too poor condition to be of any use to us. That has to change, and quickly. It will take a great deal of sweat and toil, but the industry of Central Siberia will come back online one way or another. Once this arduous task has been completed, our kingdom will have in, in its grasp a weapon more powerful than any gunner tank in the world, an industrial backbone with no equal. The people share. It was always a good day at the delicate slot when King Rurik II was in attendance at the meeting of the Zemsky Sabor, primarily because meant, uh... I've already read this one before. Yeah. If you want to read this again, please go right ahead. I read this earlier in this episode. Yeah. Okay. Well, whatever. Fires again. There's not really much we can do about that, but okay. All right. Hey. Okay. Woo. Still have a deficit. A good deficit. Well, a good deficit. Yeah, that's not good. We're, we're adding to the debt. Five. Exactly five billion. Wow. Oh. oh never mind. Even more now. The spell. Die, you fascist pigs. All you come is come should go to heck. He sh also shouts. <clears throat> and countless others could be heard from the two crowds facing each other. One unionist, one reactionary. Placards hit banner as they both came together, not in unitary unity or solidarity, but out of hatred and resentment. As the shouts of the crowds increased in amount of fury, the police standing guard looked at each other nervously. Much as they preferred not to intervene, they were being left with little choice. With one of them sent to get back up, the rest of the officers stood well with watch with grim determination ready to step in and put a stop to things if necessary fortunately for them backup arrived just in time having their numbers doubled and being ready to go on short notice by rick's own orders as they reinforced the officers already on the scene the confrontation before them began to turn violent with punches being landed and signs being thrown at the sound of the whistle the police descended as a group of the two crowds and were dealing with minor resistance they both dispersed even with the current clash taken care of each officer thought the same thing things can't keep going on like this and the white wolf oh do we have another one to do oh oh the spirit of the rust reborn Found that the political climate of Beers were stabilized. Kingsguard units no longer skirmish your supports in the streets, and the nobles are finally seeing eye to eye. A general census concluded that the workers are content and forecast no second revolution. King Rurik II. As always, well some of the Zemsky supported to determine the next course of action. The east and west lie more pretenders, selfish uh, dictators, and, who's who, and those who cling to the failed past. The new Rus will strike outwards, confidence, security, and stability. The White Wolf. It is my great honor as emperor and autocrat of all the Rus to name my son Yuri as crown prince. Upon my death, he shall become your rightful sovereign. Within an instant, most of those who were present among the Zemskis of war erupted in applause. Prince Yuri, now heir to his father's legacy, rose from his seat. As he stood, silence once again washed over the room, and the entire council had turned their attention to the new crown prince out of such a sight. It was hard for Yuri to avoid getting emotional. <clears throat> I'm deeply honored to show your by your show of trust, father. Rest assured, your legacy shall not be weathered away from your passing. 
Um, I will ensure that all the people of your realm are treated fairly and with the respect they rightfully deserve. Together we shall work towards a more just kingdom and a brighter future for all of Russia. The applause resumed and more ferocious than the last time. Ryura can help but notice that even those who remained silent before had joined him had joined in. The crown prince looked at Lydia, who had not had so much of moved a muscle since the announcement. Her expression betrayed a deep anger, a fury so intense that it could not help be expressed through words. Lydia suddenly locked eyes with her brothers, and Yuri went cold. Her gaze pierced directly into Yuri's soul, as they almost murderous in nature. Turning away from her brother, Lydia got up from her seat and left the council chamber. Most were so swept up in the festivities that they had neglected to notice the departure of the princess. Despite his victory, Yuri can help but feel some lingering regrets over the feud. Lydia's cold glance had, at the, had told the crown prince all he needed to know about how his sister felt. All hell, crown prince Yuri! Remove two walls. Oh, we lose political power now. God dang it. That sucks. Good Friday agreement in Ireland, which I need to play them again because I did screw them up when I played them the first time, so. I'll play with Ireland again someday. Not any day soon, but someday. Happy 1966, though, everybody. Yearly deficit. God dang it. Yeah, 24 divisions is good enough for now, especially once we actually go to war. We're going to need quite a pocket of extra money. Um, pocket. So, we'll see. Are you struggling against the free aviators, guys? They literally have no divisions, man. Gazov, please. Please. Advanced developmental subsidies. Ooh. I like that one. Nice. Good. Even better. Oh, is that the free aviators? No. Oh! Wait. The South African Wars could come to a close with the Union of South Africa finally defeating the OFM Provisional Government of the Congo and they're out. What? Wait, what? They defeated the... Okay. Alright then, hello. 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 I think these are still glitched and bugged. I could be wrong. Maybe except for Angola. The Angola region. I don't know. I've never played them. At least not yet. I'll play them eventually. Fortify Sibgrad. A quiet moment. Eh, sure, why not. So, reliable power supply. Yes, please. Invest in summertime ports. Yes. And then connect and expand the resource fields. Yes. Rook stood by his uh, bedroom window, looking over the city of Kemerovo. The sun was beginning to set, the sky a blend of soft and orange and blue. The sun began to sink below the horizon. Rurik reflected upon his rule. From the pit of despair, he had given Russia hope, bringing light to a country adrift in darkness. His rule had not been peaceful and had not been perfect, but he had achieved a great deal. The sun was halfway below the horizon, the orange sky turning to red and then red fading to purple. The first star was beginning to shine down from the heavens, outnumbered by the lights from the city below. The king grew weaker with every passing day, and he needed a cane to move about his palace. Rurik knew he would not live to see Moscow freed from the Germans who enslaved his people. He would have to leave that duty to his successor, his heir, Prince Yuri. He knew that they could succeed. He believed that he had just prepared them well. His child would lead his kingdom to greatness and avenge the humiliation the mother had been, motherland had been put through. Nikolai Krylov chuckled, knowing that his children and the rest of the nation were so attached to the Rurik ideals, the mask he had finally become. The sun was now below the horizon, night had fallen over the motherland once more. King Rurik turned away from the window and returned to his desk, for the king still had much work to do. Only in the darkness, in the darkness can you see the stars. Slowly improve poverty rate? Yes, please. Work programs. The years of fighting across central Siberia was brutal and heavily destructive, and many towns had been reduced to not much more than smoldering ruins. Even several months after the fighting, much of the damage from the wars has yet to be repaired. Thousands are without homes and out of work, and the situation could grow out of control if nothing else is done. Our king, ever considerate of his people's woes, has a solution to kill two birds with a stone. His specialized work program was created with a task of repairing any and all damage caused by the fighting that had gone without repairs. The towns and villages of central Siberia will be returned to the former glory, and in the process we will provide thousands of people with steady jobs to put food on their table. Which is a great, great thing. A better deficit? Good. Ooh, more admin? Ooh. More taxable population? Yes. Absolutely. Nothing else there yet, which is fine. Minus 0.25, not bad. French victory in West Africa. Well, let's see how much it collapses. The town East Africa has collapsed already. Yeah, it looks like a mess down here. Because then again, it's the Middle East. What do you expect? Sure, why not? Wow. Preserving the past, building the future. So who's actually down here? Golda Meir. Well, King Rurik II slowly passed alongside a large-scale model of the newly proposed renovations Kemerovo, making sure to soak in every detail. For too long, he had been forced to hold court in the frozen remains of a proper city. Should the vision depicted within the model before him be realized, Kemerovo would shine once more as a power, uh, center of power fit for the monarch of uh, King Rurik II's stature. Foreign Minister and Royal Architect Pyotr Baranovsky stood in the corner of the room, looking on as his liege gleefully examined the model he put together. Rurik II was usually a gloomy old fellow, but today his eyes betrayed the excitement of a child in a candy store. I trust everything is to your liking, Your Grace. Masterful work as always, Baranovsky, fleeting visions of Russia's past transplanted into the present. 
The work of the second's gaze remained focused on the models he spoke, and he leaned in for a closer look. The proposed buildings were not unlike the kingdom itself, taking clear inspiration from the architectural legacy of medieval Russia, marred or married with a sensible modern touch, with walls of red and white crowned with a variety of garishly decorated roofs. The structures of the hypothesized, hypothesized city were a feast for the eyes. Rick finally managed to peel his attention away from the model and towards the architect. Marvelous, simply marvelous. When can I expect the revelations to begin, Baronovsky? As soon as we're able to, Your Grace, we just require you'll have it. Whatever it is, it shall be yours. So long as this masterpiece becomes reality. Building a mighty legacy one brick at a time. Building upon Bukharin's plan. For all his faults. Not everything that Nikolai Bukharin did was inherently bad. For one, his Siberian plan transformed Siberia from a desolate backwater to a formidable industrial powerhouse. The effects of his plan can still be felt to this very day. And is the reason why the potential for our industry is so immense. The years, unfortunately, have not been kind of Siberia, although the infrastructure established in Bukharin's day is still mostly operational. I've seen much better days. Rook the second wishes to reverse the decay, and to that new, to that end, a new expanded Siberian plan will begin. She has plans to see the kingdom's industrial strength will soar to glorious new heights. Great. We're just gonna balloon this debt to never before seen levels. Work programs. Minus 2.25, still pretty good. Hungry sets of Germany. Where are we at? 110. Um, still not going up fast enough. No. Ooh, basic literacy is not bad, too. Our military professionalism is not bad. Yeah. A new currency. Ever since the fall of the Union, the ruble has become increasingly irrelevant to the point of being worth less than toilet paper. Foreign currencies have begun to grow in popularity in various regions across Russia and particularly uh, desperate places. <clears throat> the locals have resorted to a primitive barter economy, His Majesty's Rome. In, the f in His, His Majesty's Rome, this farce will not be allowed to continue, of course. <clears throat> The Royal Ministry of Finance proposed a radical new idea to help build the kingdom's economy to something resembling a functionality. They wish to introduce a new currency known as a Grivna, and all territories currently controlled by the Rurik II. With the hope that it will be able to stem the tide of foreign currencies worming their way into Russian society, the Grivna pictures a new currency for the new Russia seems like a solid base or idea worth considering. Well, my apologies. Interest rates will go down. Growth will increase. Not bad. But we'll get way more uh, inflation. A helping hand. In an unlikely village of Siberia, torn apart by clashing. Soldiers during the unification wars and looted by fleeing bandits and impoverished residents that remain, uh, remain suddenly in their homes, shivering in the wind as if afraid they, they left the village itself would be destroyed or stolen. Considering some of the stories they had heard are even more unfortunate villages, it very might well be even with them there. They little food, less warmth, and no guns of any note, all that awaited them was a slow death. Suddenly began to hear the sound of boots on the ground and looked out of the windows with a mixture of fear and dread. Had the bandits returned, they had nothing of value left to give them. However, as the sound grew closer, they began able to make out shapes and when the people they made up. There were no bandits, these were workers from the royal government, the ones that won the wars. Their fear was replaced by a new and similar one. Had taxes been increased? However, the new rivals greeted them am amiably as they passed, and one man even ruffled the hair of a boy with his head sticking out of the window. As the villagers watched in amazement, these workers set about repairing the damage to the complex had done to the village, repaired ho holes in the walls, and shattered windows. These men were not here to take from them, they were here to give them help they so badly needed for so long. Some of the villagers cheered as they were returned, or worked. Others wept with joy. Others thought the same. Luck had finally returned to their lives. Some semblance of hope had returned to their hearts. Perhaps Rurik does care about us after all. Well, we'll see. After that, we'll do ro Royal University Charters, which would be nice. Pretty good. Yeah, I'm so concerned about this. But hey, that's actually better. Oh, no, it's actually surplus now. Not bad. Not bad at all. So we have to fight Irkutsk. It's going to be kind of a pain in the butt. We can't peacefully reunify with them. Honestly, we'll do okay, probably. Samara will probably do fine. They're going to be a pain in the butt to try to kill off, though. They're definitely going to be a pain in the butt. Oh, um, usually they fall apart against us, but you know, you never know. Not bad. Octobi? Who's in this group? Nikolai Ono Prienko. Prienko. Alright. Uh, research facilities and whatnot. Or Royal University Charters. The horrendous state of the Russia has been in for the past decade has had all kinds of consequences for the millions of Russian civilians forced to dodge bullets and artillery shells as the world lord selfishly fought amongst themselves. However, now that Rurik II has restored peace to central Siberia, there may be yet a glimmer of hope for its unfortunate generation. The king has thoughtfully decreed that the royal universities are to be established in every major town currently under his protection. These esteemed centers of learning will provide education to all of Rurik II's subjects and give the youth of Arsha a chance uh, that they hadn't had in years, the opportunity, the opportunity to receive a proper education. There goes Litovs. Political thought. I mean, I like weekly stability. Yeah, what can you get more um, war support, maybe? Um, manpower. More weekly. Eh. 
Eh, you can do it once, why not? We could use more war support. We could always use more war support, right? Right. After this, after you get all the industry stuff done, they won't start making like helicopters and stuff and really focusing on them. Or maybe not. Maybe we should just go ahead after this one. French community? Yeah, after this one, let's just go start getting some helicopter stuff done. I want some attack helis and better transport helis, so. Nice. Siberian wealth, the knowledge of Tomsk. Oh, rapidly improve, yeah. Oh, even in the darkness of this warlord era, <clears throat> the intelligentsia of Tomsk have somewhat managed to maintain a highly sophisticated society where art and science have thrived long after the collapse of the Soviet Union. With the scene now under Rurik is the second's control. Hundreds of highly intelligent individuals are left wondering what their place will be within His Majesty's realm. The expertise of these wise men and women would be a great boon to the royal cause, and it would be a massive waste to not continue the patronage they once received under the CSR. The scientists that once worked for the Republic will be encouraged to lend their talents to us, and they will be allowed to continue their work without any interruptions. The intelligentsia of Tomsk will know that they have nothing to fear from the new king, and the reestablished trade routes. The kingdom's infrastructure is still in less than an ideal state, and as a result, and you know, commerce that comes and goes with through the king's lands will encounter many inconvenient difficulties on their journeys. Siberia is a vast, harsh land, and without the proper roads, a trip through this region is a daunting task indeed. Sponsored by His Majesty's fin Ministry of Finance, the new trade routes are to be established throughout the kingdom. The roads that still require repairs will get the attention they need, and extensive trade outposts will be constructed in even the most far flung corners of Siberia to give the weary travelers a place to find respite. And Siberian Wolf. Siberia is one of the most bountiful places on Earth in terms of natural resources, but the constant wars have made it nearly impossible to take advantage of this fact. Now that the guns have finally fallen silent thanks to the efforts of Rurik II and his armies, we can finally turn attention to the bounties that await us beneath the soil. There are still many mines dotted around the region dating back to the Bukharan's era that have gone unused since the collapse, and can serve our purposes handily. Harnessing Siberia's resources is a major step towards building a strong economy for the kingdom, and it would be foolish to ignore the vast wealth that lies just beneath our feet. Uh, all this stuff is great to do, but I'll do this one first. Crown Cooperatives. After taking into consideration the wise advice given to him by his Ministry of Finance, His Majesty King Rurik II plans to announce the next big step in aiding his loyal workers, the Crown Cooperatives. Instead of suffering under the tyranny of a rich oligarch, the only authority workers belonging to the Cooperatives will have to answer to, this, to the King himself. These Cooperatives will be allowed to choose their leaders democratically, and these elected crowns or officials will in turn answer directly to the Crown. Already confident that this ingenious idea would be a triumph for the workers' rights in the Kingdom, uh, Rurik II also believes that the Cooperatives will go a long way towards increasing the efficiency of the workforce. Intellectual scuffles. Rurik sat at the head of the Vesh, filled with former members of the Tomsk Salons, intellectuals, poets, professors, the most intelligent people of Russia crowded into one room. Rurik was certain they would be of good use to Central Siberia. Gentlemen, said Rurik, in a booming voice, I'm glad all of you accepted my accepted my invitation. I was a great and kind leader. I'm uh, wise enough to understand that there can be much to be learned from your enemies. Why? shouted a man in a sleek salute looking very different compared to Rurik's ministers in large robes. You're insane, not wise. You declared yourself star after you had too much to drink. Rurik smiled. At least I'm wise enough to defeat your armies in battle. The group grew quiet, almost hostile. As I was saying, I invited you here today for your ideas. Central Siberia is hard to govern, and our economic situation is less than positive. Your Salons were among those who governed Central Siberia when Russia first fell apart. We are all Russians, and this is our home. And the room remained quiet until a man with uh, glasses broke the silence. Rurik, we may have a disagreement, but I can tell you are a caring man if you truly want to make the lives of your people better. I implore you to consider greater welfare for the people. War has ravaged Russia, of course, and they need hope of a better future. Who needs welfare? shouted a man, a small man in a tie that reached down to his waist. We don't have the money for that. What we need, or what the people need, is education. Only then they will be able to improve their lives themselves and serve the country. No man could just throw money into the air and expect the problems to be fixed. Another man, a slender, slender and wearing a formal-looking hat, stood up. The people will not have satisfaction without democracy. As long as you continue to be a tyrant, sir, this place will only see despair. As the shouting match continued and more men began to speak over each other, Rurik was reminded of his children's own petty bickering. No wonder Tomsk fell. Its own government couldn't agree on anything. That's the least worth a try. The arteries of a nation. A large crowd gathered had gathered before Lev Vosnesensky wore a practiced smile on his face while thanked by armed guards. Did I bring to you the people of Russia great news? He proclaimed, the great highway connecting Krasnoyarsk, Kamarovo, and Novosibirsk has of yesterday been completed. Rejoice, for now nothing will hinder the free movement of trade and of you, the people. The crowd murmured along, among themselves, though for the most part they seemed unsure what to make of the finished development, no matter. Worst comes worse, I'll have to come around, after all, whether they liked it or not, the highway would play a large part of their lives from now on. Over the next few days, traffic on the highway increased at first slowly, then exponentially, with reports of booming trade arriving at Vosnesensky's office. It was just as he had thought. With any obstacles removed from their path, people couldn't resist the allure of traveling elsewhere to sell their wares for more. It was astounding that the old government in Tomsk had never thought of this, but then he had never placed that much stock into them anyways. Yes, he thought, lighting a cigarette between his teeth, this was going to make a lot of people a lot of money. Most importantly, of course, himself. Long live the king that makes me rich. Which is great, 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 great. Of course, we're still doing Siberian wealth. We did read about crown cooperatives, which would be extremely important to do next. Um, more growth is great. I love industrial equipment. Industrial equipment or agriculture. Agriculture is where? 
it's not bad but and equipment well, let's do equipment next after we'll do that one of course uh, industrial modernization is what we're gonna do next after cron cooperatives and get even more growth yeah more growth please better poverty rate oh yes please we have 21 production units which is not enough but whatever that's never enough happy october lover buddy happy 1966 october a little bit of lag but what else is new there you go Although our efforts to bring the factories of Central Siberia into the modern age were mostly successful, the fact remains that the equipment used in these facilities were woefully inadequate, and no amount of polishing and ad hoc repairs will repair or fix problems caused by the unrelenting march of time. Therefore, it is necessary that we make an effort to completely finish the modernization of our industry by improving the equipment and machinery therein. Once his Majesty's workforce has the finest, most cutting-edge mechanical tools available at their disposal, the efficiency of the Kingdom's factories was so far, far beyond what they were previously capable of. Let's check out the unions. If you want to read from from councils into guilds, please go right ahead. But, oh, we'll do the foundries of Nova Sibirsk. The Siberian plan dragged Siberia kicking and screaming to the modern age, and as a result, it was transformed into Russia's industrial heartland virtually overnight. Nowhere can the effects of this ambition, uh, undertaking, ambitious undertaking can be seen more clearly than Nova Sibirsk, which was a city that was most, was most profoundly affected by the industrialization of the region. The numerous foundries and factories of Nova Sibirsk were unfortunately left to rot under the corrupted Siloviki government that came to control the city. Now that the season rook kids are work the second's hands, the situation must change. The factories of Nova Sibirsk must be running again, and the city must reclaim its place as an industrial capital of Siberia. The Army of the Rus, which is something we're still going to read too. Uh, we'll talk about this one last, probably. So we'll do the founders of Nova Sibirsk, but follow it up with what are we going to do? Rook diplomacy? Despite very much in the, being in the dire straits a few years ago, our glorious Prince Balti has grown to become the preeminent power of central Siberia and can no longer be considered a petty warlord state by any sensible person. To further cement this realm's legitimacy on the global stage, Rurik II wishes to begin making diplomatic overtures across the globe. With a few hurried words, his diplomats may just be able to find some powerful friends willing to take our claim to Russia very seriously. All that has to be done now is make the arrangements. Political thought. Uh, that's not bad. Construction. Expand the power grid. I think we'll be fine with without doing that, but yeah, I don't think we need to do that right now. But we'll see. You never know. Ooh, lost production here though. Okay, what is happening? Come on, man. No one cares about Muscovine. Uh, we're getting the planes. Come on. Oh my god, no one cares a crap about Muscovine. Oh, yeah, yeah. It takes so long to do. Uh, helis. Caucasine. Oh god, Borman, come on. I guess a plus, that's nice. More growth is good too. Very good. Uh, oh, science expenditures? Might as well. More growth? Sounds great. Oh, the army of the Rus. With a new principal today should come a new army. Although it's proven to be its superiority over our foes during the unification of Central Siberia, our military is still woefully outdated in nearly every respect, from the way it's organized down to the equipment for our soldiers are to use. Before we can seriously consider that any kind of plans to reunify the nation, our military needs to be brought up to modern standards. This process will be long and not exactly easy, but a fully modernized military would be the envy of the king's many foes, and make reconquest all the more simple, of course. It looks like we got a lot of good stuff here, but it's definitely not enough. Honestly, we're not going to have enough for anti-air, so I'm just going to take it off now. It's better to do it now than later. Yeah, heli early helicopters, 270 is not enough. In all honesty. Um, at least get one on these guys first. Yeah. And go up to five. Oh, there goes a Nega. Um, where are we at for agriculture right now? It's so close. It's best to wait, but I want the party effect now, so. It's better to do it now, because we'll have time to get it done later anyways. A meritocratic system. In decades past, officers got the command based on the significance of the background. Whether it was a noble blood, wealth, ethnicity, loyalty to the party, F such foolishness was one of the many factors that caused the humiliation of the Russian Empire in the First World War, and then the Soviet Union in the Second World War. We cannot afford to repeat the mistakes of the past, and for to do so surely invite disaster as it has before many times. In King Rurik II's newly reformed military, advancement will come from merit alone. Our officers will have all to prove themselves to be capable leaders on the field of battle, and only then will they be given the privilege of a promotion. With the aid of battle-hardened experienced officers that guide the troops, our armies will undoubtedly march to victory to, from victory to victory. Yeah, we could definitely use that pretty much immediately. It, it's too slow for us to wait to get that one, so. Right, so now let's come back over here. Do that. Back to work. Oh, Gavril stood among a throng of his fellow workers, the scent of sweat and the sound of conversation hanging heavy over the group of fifty or sixty or so men. Heart hat on his head and hammer slung over his shoulders, Gavril squinted against the morning glare as he gazed upon the factory complex he had just worked in. It had certainly been refurbished, and this gave him and many others preparing to enter the building hope that the old mad king had actually kept his promise. 
Some. Four men out of Gabriel's blue view blew a whistle and a mass of working men suddenly shifted forward. Gabriel found himself swept along the tide and into his new workplace, his heart full of op cautious optimism, as he and other workers crossed a broad threshold. That optimism was quickly crushed, as while the exterior had been decorated with fancy trappings, calling back to airs long gone with a modern safe undercurrent, the interior of the foundry that wasn't that different from what it was before. At first, an unexpectedly belched out flame like some ash cake dragon sent four men to the infirmary. With a rickety stairway up to the second level that had been broken and repaired dozens of times, and with many of his coal workers' legs, ribs, or skulls. The busted, uh, uh case, casing, a ladle that periodically leaked molten metal, burned the flesh of the operator. It wasn't all bad, however. The doors, for one, could be opened from the inside in case of emergency. The wiring that kept the lights on was safely sealed inside the walls. There was a list of safety protocols, first aid tips, or other useful information on every wall. But what relief of the most was the presence of enough gloves, tanks, aprons, and other safety tools to protect every man in the building. The machines may still be dangerous, but the madman has at least made a token effort towards safety still. Gabriel did not feel much safer than he did before the city changed hands. Under the red flag, same as the old flag. Not bad. And uh, poverty is about 56, 57%, basically, 57%. Oh, academic base is about to go up. Research facility is about to go up. Uh, agriculture is very close to being to go up. It'll take two more months. That's all right. You know what happens. Admin efficiency is going up quite a bit. Industrial expertise is looking actually very good. Equipment has shot up a whole lot, a whole lot more. It's awesome. Oh, we're back up to 21. Nice. The Army of the Rose, Ameritocratic System, the Royal Inspection. The men stood in rigid rows, their uniforms clean, and their rifles resting in their arms. General Ivan Yakovlev's men were clearly attempting to make the best impression possible. General Yakovlev walked down the rows discussing the state of his army to King Rurik. Back when he first donned the crown, your majesty, these men couldn't even line up straight. Now look at them, disciplined, clean, and some of the finest men east of the Urals. Yakovlev's words had some merit, with Rurik having just seen the men perform a training exercise. They performed admirably, a far cry from the ragtag, desperate men Rurik had left under Andrei's betrayal. Of course, there was still room for improvement. The equipment they carried was still outdated, albeit some progress there had been made in the last couple of months. Rurik, it, Rurik brought up these concerns, among others, and Yakovlev largely agreed, yes. The situation regarding equipment and uniforms was less than desired, and the men could do, lose more out easier than I'd like, but I'd say that we've greatly improved, Your Majesty. If you ignore the issue of equipment, in which my hands are tied, how does Your Majesty feel about the state of your army? I see more discipline. You've seen, done a lot of good work here, Yakovlev. With their eyes set upon seizing the eastern shores of the motherland, I hope you can continue to show such excellent results. I'll try my best, Your Majesty. The finest soldiers in all of us. Issue Royal Pardons. Ooh, Army Experience Gain. Ooh, that'd be good to do. As much as I'm going to do this one, but train new officers. The key to building a professional army lies in its officers, and we will need plenty of them as we continue to expand the military, luckily for us. There's a whole new generation of young officers just waiting to begin their journeys towards becoming the generals of tomorrow. Therefore, it's high time for the military schools of Central Siberia to open their doors once more so that prospecting and recruits can be tutored in the difficult art of waging war. The new recruits are to be trained to the highest possible standard for the king's military officers are to be the best of the best, consisting of the cream of the what Russia has to offer. Not only will this lead to a better military, but also may result in unorthodox new strategic innovations as well. Oh, maximum command power increase, starting level of new army leaders. Army XP gain is really what we're going after right now. Uh, foreign instructors, poverty relief. Yes, please. And then we're at what? Nice. Very good. Oh, was there another one here? Work of training? Yes. Oh, whoops, I should have waited for that one. Crap. Ah, oh, crap. Eh, that's alright. Whatever. Agriculture will uh, go up within the next month. I'll probably do rocket stuff here, too. Combat rules. Learn from... Oh, that'll be good to do. Learning from the Siberian Conquest. We'll do this one and the other stuff as well. So, we got time. We definitely have plenty of time. It's only 67. We can start going to war in 69. Probably about, like, April, May-ish. So, it, it, just, it just takes time. Armor improvements. Steady weapon designs. Uh, helicopters would be nice. Even though we got that. Oh, that's not bad. Pride of the King? Not bad. Not bad at all. <clears throat> uh, we deficit still, which sucks. Better agriculture methods? There we go. If you don't worry about that, please go ahead for this bread we think thee. Nice. Very good. So after that one, now we'll come over here and prove agriculture mechanization. Uh, the kingdom's agricultural state is in a sorry state, to put it mildly. To put it another way, our farmers are forced to make do with tools and methods that would seem not out of place on farms from 500 years ago. While His Majesty is well known for his appreciation for Russia's ancient customs, some things are better left in the past if they're going to actively harm our agricultural output. The king believes that a full-scale mechanization of his realm's agriculture is in order. The process will no doubt be expensive, but any price is worth paying if it involves getting more food on the table faster. Our farms will become renowned throughout Russia for their efficiency. Unshuckled unions. As an issue of the workers rising, the kingdom continues to surface. His Majesty is considered taking another large step towards creating a better environment for all loyal workers. The royal union is already established as a way to ensure the workers are not being taken advantage of while still maintaining royal oversight. Or they expand far beyond the original capabilities. With the proposed reforms, the royal unions will be granted a great deal of freedom to run their affairs as they see fit without too much interference from the crown. With far fewer bureaucratic obstacles in their path, the king hopes that the unions will become more effective in their duties to the workers of the realm. Nice. 
Statewalker, yeah. Science stuff. Oops. Oh, I should have waited. Oh, I should I really should have waited. Holy crap. That's my fault. I'm just like, yeah, let's get her done. Nice. Still have a good amount of political power, though. More production units? Nice. Oh, let's go with six there and go with 20. Actually, I don't see that. There you go. Overall, not bad. Uh, Diefenbacher regains power? Regains power, huh? Alright, well, whatever. I don't know anything about him, but okay. I'll do diplomacy. Overtures, emissaries of the rising sun. Uh, friends of the steps. Current Kazakh government is not friendly to us. We should condemn them as an illegitimate government. Halls of glory. Well, we'll do work in diplomacy next. And they're probably learning from Siberian conquests. Which would be good. Also, since these guys only use guns, literally only use guns, we can just train them indefinitely, pretty much. And they get more daily army XP. 0 0.03. They don't get a ton, but you know what? We need to work on our land doctrine. Learning from the Siberian conquest. The wars to reunify central Siberia were brutal and hard fought, but his majesty's armies proved their worth and achieved victory in the end. To better understand their own strengths and flaws, it would be wise to look back and examine the doctrines of both their own forces as well as those of our enemies. We will find out exactly what worked and what didn't. And once this is done, the king's military staff can devise new strategies and tactics built upon the best aspects of each. With the advantages, once utilized by our foes now assimilated into the royal army, we'll have made a good start towards reshaping the central Siberian military into a fearsome force indeed. There is power in the union. Rurik was woken up by a peaceful nap by the ringing of his telephone, residing on his table just beside his bed. Grumbling, he sat up and fumbled for a phone, lifting to his ear and sighing, Hello? Hello, Your Highness, this is Boris Kelchev. I spoke with you the other day. Rurik's thoughts wandered to a question. How did this man get his personal number? That question was answered quickly for him. However, as a union boss carried on for his, uh, in his gravely baritone. Your son, Yuri, gave me the number at the meeting. We're wondering if... Oh, if you're wondering. Uh, that's right, Rurik thought. He loved that boy and understood the cause and the pain of the kingdom's working class, but darn if he didn't jump the gun every time there was an opportunity to help. Too nice for his own good, muttered Rurik inaudibly. Oh, yes, yes, it was a wonderful meeting. You, What are you calling to discuss? Well, really, I'm calling to thank you. I wasn't, I wasn't so sure how sincere you were when you said you'd be strengthening the unions, but your reforms have really paid off. The boss is treating us far, far better, and the actions are down 20% because they're keeping the equipment clean and repaired. The union thanks you, King Rurik. That put a smile on the old man's face. Perhaps you have been right after all. The workers are the lifeblood of the kingdom, and they're better off than ever. Showing, following a short exchange of goodbyes, Rurik put down the phone and laid his head back on the pillow, one thought in his mind. Maybe I should listen to Yuri more often. Maybe. Expand the shield maidens. In her new realm, every devoted subject is willing to risk their lives to fight for a better Russia. Even the women. It was no more apparent than during the wars in central Siberia. When her specially assembled force of elite female soldiers, the shield maidens proved themselves to be more effective than we could have ever anticipated. <clears throat> the implications are here are clear. We have now an excellent source of manpower that has, until now, gone completely untapped. No longer. With the assistance of Princess Lydia, we'll begin to raise more shield maiden divisions to allow the women of Central Siberia with more the opportunity to fight for the king. With more fierce, fierce shield maidens and at uh, the king's command, who could possibly help to challenge them on the field of battle? The march of the worker. Up with the workers, down with the bosses. Long live the unions. Uh, as the striking unions marched outside, a few police officers watched, unsure what to do. The strike was the latest of series, and easily the t largest. The union had paralyzed the city of Rosnoyarsk in the demand for better pay and working conditions. Business leaders weren't happy with the situation, that much was clear, but they had been ordered not to disrupt strikes, and orders were to be followed. Their hands were tied, and there was nothing to be done about it. After hours of agonizing shutdown for the city, business leaders and finally uh, finally came to the strikers to negotiate, being greeted by boos and jeers and leaving with their heads down to the sounds of cheers. Clearly they had earned themselves new few friends and much animosity among those who had worked for them. Even so, looking at all the people who hadn't been able to simply carry on with their lives, one had to wonder, was there really no other way to a better world? The needs of the people come before all else. Our best side. <clears throat> now, education would be good, and developmental subsidies, yes, please. And uh, industrial equipment would begin to slowly improve too, which is good. Royal Ministry of Architecture, uh, Pietro Baranowski speaking. Is that a way to address your King uh, Baranowski? For shame, the old King's speech was noticeably slurred. Uh, even from behind the telephone, Baranowski sighed. He didn't know what to expect from the old man when he was drunk. I apologize, Your Grace. What do you require of me? Let me ask you a question, uh, Baranowski. How can I claim to be the rightful sovereign of Rus when the world doubts my authority? The great leaders of the world look at me as though I was a crazy old man playing dress-up. A monarch of my prestige does not deserve to be treated this way. With all due respect, my liege, don't you think that we have more important things to worry about than our image? There was a pause. Baranowski briefly wondered if he had forgotten this place. I do not, sense, Peter. We're going, too. <clears throat> Settle this, you and me. Uh, you, you and I, what? Indeed, Peter. We are now, you are now head of my new royal ministry of foreign affairs. I already have a few suitable candidates to serve as our ambassadors. I expected to put them to work post haste, but I... Well, sudden click. The conversation was brought to an abrupt halt. Baranowski was left at a loss for words, and the phone still pressed to his ear. The time to make an impression.
And we're not going to do or improve our land doctrine yet because we want to get that uh, focus done first. That'll be good. And then Shield Maidens. And we'll probably do a lot of this stuff over here too. Which would be nice. Very nice. I wish we kind of had more stuff to do, but whatever. How are we doing down here? Transport planes are maxed out. We need some early fighters too. Makes sense to me. Makes a lot of sense to me. Because how many will we need for this? For uh, Oh, we need to get the Special Forces one done too. Let's actually use them. Wow, minus 0.42 is really good. Ooh, we're going to get better industrial expertise as well. Awesome. Emissaries to the Rising Sun. Although the Japanese were partly responsible for Russia's total humiliation in the Second World War, we cannot deny that opening relations with the premier economic powerhouse of the East would be of great benefit to our young nation, perhaps. It would be for the best to put our past grievances behind us and reach out with good intentions. Royal envoys will be dispatched to Tokyo to begin making important diplomatic overtures, and then the Sunrise Kingdom. And with luck, they'll be able to convince the Japanese that Direct II is a man to be taken seriously. From there, lucrative economic deals could potentially be forged to help bring the Prince of Baltic's economy back on a global market. But if you want to build better industrial expertise, please go ahead. Please go right ahead. Great. 4.7% growth. Not enough. We still have a deficit, which sucks. But, you know, whatever. Not much we can really do about that. Keep training, 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 training. Oh. In 67, this fine finished. Oh, nega has been demilitarized, but they got what they wanted. Sort of-ish. Oh, uh, sure, we can do that one, because why not? Land doctrine. Thank you. Organization defense. Infrastructure reserve. Thank you. That's why we waited. <clears throat> Mechanized uh, infantry corps. Uh, issue all parts first. Our various enemies during the wars of unification fought well indeed, and they have many generals among them who are definitely cut above the standard career officers, unfortunately. The fact remains that they were our enemies, and most of them now sit in a military prison for their crimes against Rurik II and his people. Rurik explored the idea of issuing pardons towards specific officers who once served with their enemies. Uh, in exchange for the freedom, they must make an oath of loyalty to the king and serve with his armed forces. Should his majesty choose to go down this route, our force will be bolstered with several more talented officers who can aid us with their expertise. Although our king still holds well-deserved grudges towards some of these men, there is still yet maybe a path for redemption for those whose only crime was being on the wrong side. And then a new Siberian woman. But if you wonder about better military professionals, then please go right ahead. Yes, sir. Excellent, excellent. Oh, wow, a lot more political power. Um, machinery, yes. Propaganda? Weekly stability, returning expatriates. Why do you have five here, then? Power grid? We're okay. Standing beside her fathers, he waved to the soldiers below, Princess Lydia Krylova, not even attempt to suppress a savage grim. Because each and every one of those soldiers was a woman, a member of the first expansion division of the Shield Maidens, and there will be many more to come. It would have been hard, very hard, to convince some of the old generals and men of power in the state that the Shield Maidens even had a legitimate purpose, let alone that they would be expanded. But she had prevailed, as usual. The proof was in front of her, and it heralded in front of her a great future. For with women being openly welcomed into the armed forces, the state's available manpower had nearly doubled. Such expanded reserves had far uses beyond simply fighting on the front lines as well, as proven by the presence of General Anna Kostir on the uh, dais beside Lydia and the king. There will soon be more like her, the opportunities now available making sure that the potential of half the state's citizens would not be wasted. Yes, Lydia thought this had been an important victory. More soldiers and more troops meant that the state could continue to expand and consolidate its territory, and subsequent security threats could be made more easily addressed without compromising strength at the front. Of course, it all helped that all the new shield maidens very knew well who have fought to afford them this opportunity, how easily others might conspire to take it away. Who could truly tell when such an understanding could pr prove critical? They have and all will continue to prove themselves as equal of any other soldier. And of course, we'll do pardons, overtures to Washington. The envoys in the U.S. have been making a great deal of progress in during them to our existence. I have noted that the Americans have been quite receptive to their diplomatic efforts. It's not hard to see why. Although the prince policy still has lingering Soviet influence all throughout its policies, we still outwardly de defy both the communists and the fascists, thus making it appealing to target for the U.S. support. Uh, <clears throat> The Royal Diplomatic Office is to instruct the envoys in Washington to begin opening talks to aim, with the aim of establishing an embassy of our own on U.S. soil. Once they've accomplished this, they will have essentially opened the door to mutually beneficial trade deals with what remains of the free world. Context in the East. Hidden away in the Foreign Office. Uh, Pyotr Baranovsky sat working at his desk, with his pen incessantly scratching against a piece of paper. He was not pleased when he heard a rude interruption of his important business. Looking up from his work, he was surprised to see that the envoy he sent to Japan earlier that month had returned to one place. His astonishment was only heightened when he learned that they had succeeded in their task. They had forged a diplomatic connection with the Empire of the East as, as such news. Baranovsky assumed it could only be good for the future of the kingdom he served. Yet, as... <clears throat> So often the case with the foreign minister, there was plenty more work to be done, after all. Baranovsky knew that communications were on their way, or on their own, would not improve the economy of the kingdom. What good news, though? Mm. Oh, we can spend it, why not? How's this looking right now? Four? It's not bad. Railways, roads, eventually. I mean, getting more resources is always good, don't get me wrong. Especially in a place like this.
Feoku in Chile. Um, how's supply around here too? That's something we want to think about as well. Not good. Because fighting the fires is going to be god awful. We already know it's going to be god awful, and it's always god awful. I can't wait to improve our administrative efficiency though. Nice. That's looking pretty good, honestly. Royal pardons. And of course, overtures to Washington. Is that about the investments? Yes, please. Ah, oh, royal pardons. As the king's armies grew, it became clear he needed more men to lead them. Unfortunately, most of the royal court's candidates were already in charge of armies. He didn't look beyond his own trusted allies and look for candidates um, from elsewhere in central Siberia, specifically. The former generals of Nova Siberia stumps in the People's Revolutionary Council. These men swear loyalty to the king Rurik. Then we can pardon them for the crimes of aiding enemy regimes and integrate them into our forces. Of course, some of King Rurik's advisors say that pardoning these former generals is too dangerous and advance, and that we can't trust them at all. Only a few advisors protest integrating the generals of Nova Siberia, whose ideology or lack thereof is most compatible with their own. They'd be the easiest to integrate, but some worry they may attempt to overthrow the king in favor of the military like they did at the C CSR. The generals of Tomsk are not rejected for fear of a military coup, instead we fear their ideology. The generals of Tomsk are feared to be radical republicans, and never their advisors protect protest their integration for this reason. And there are the generals of the People's Revolutionary Council, almost the entire court believes them to be unforgivable, and many call for the socialists to be rounded up and exiled away from the realm, however. Some argue that any of their generals who can betray their marks the deals enough to swear fealty to King Rurik can be sufficiently trusted. All this discussion matters not in the end, as it is a king's decision to issue a royal pardon, who will we choose? No pardons? Pardon the Novosibirsk? Tomsk? Communist? Pardon them all? Pardon them all, why not? And Zabatsu investments. We can do that one, mechanized infantry corps. Ah, the Zaibatsu. We hold a great much deal of influence in the Japanese economic machine, and their economic ambitions hold great weight uh, in the sphere. The king's economic advisor have proposed making attempts to reaching out to these Zaibatsu to see if they're interested in making investments in central Siberia. This region is incredibly rich in natural resources, and thus a nation has much to offer them. All we would have to do is convince them of the fact that there's so much money to be made here in Siberia, and the door to cooperation with these powerful economic forces of nature will officially be open. Although some in Rurik the Second's court are uh, just trustful of the Zaibatsu as they should be. He's convinced that they are no threat as long as their requests are not too demanding. Friends and Seps, our southern neighbors, those the Kazakhs found themselves uh, in a very similar predicament following the disastrous collapse of the Soviet Union. The nation in itself found it uh, divided among petty warlords, each fighting for his own vision of the ideal Kazakh state, and the conflicts were as frequent as they were bloody. Recently, however, the situation has turned around dramatically. Kazakhstan has been united under a single government once more, and the divisions that once plagued the Kazakh steppes are now seem to have been healed for the time being. Now would be a perfect time for the king's ambassadors to reach out to the Kazakh government to see if their leaders are willing to open relations. Assuming the government is willing to entertain such an idea in the first place. It wouldn't hurt to ask, of course. Tidings from America. Peter Baranowski found himself hard at work at his desk, laboring well into the night. The new foreign minister was so consumed with his work that he initially failed to notice that a figure had shuffled into his office. Peter pulled his attention away from the paperwork and towards his guest. He immediately recognized the exhausted man as one of his ambassadors. Ah, Yevgeny, I apologize. I was so busy I didn't see you there. My vision must be getting worse with age. How was your trip to the States? It was incredible, Pietro. You should have seen the wonders they had there. You wouldn't believe it unless you saw it. They had these brightly lit buildings that you could drive right up to and order the most amazing meals, like almost like a giant food stall. I could hardly... Yes, yes, but what was actually wondering about your meeting with Americans went well. Ah, of course, the Americans would be honored to establish formal diplomatic relations with the realm as soon as possible. As we speak, my people are working out details with Washington over our new embassy. Excellent work, Yevgeny. His Majesty will be pleased, no doubt. Pietro didn't show up, but the success of the mission caused him great elation. He wasn't so sure in the past, but the architect was beginning to think that people that perhaps he had a real talent for diplomacy to cut their game after all. Now please tell me more about the wonders you saw in America. Japan declines in vests. Baranovsky struggled to find a suitable way to break the news to his monarch. Rook will certainly be upset by the news. The king had been expecting to receive a large amount of support from Japan in the future. The foreign secretary continued to try and find a way in which he could assure the king that the future cooperation would not be ruled out. Yet no matter which way he constructed what he might was going to say, he could not undermine the fact that the kingdom would be worse off with lack of investment. Many would be left unemployed and the state finances would be much worse off as a result. In the back end, all Baranowski could come up with is assurance that one day Siberia's vast wealth will be uncovered. For now, the expanse of land under his highest domain will remain undisturbed, but when it's inevitably explode, exploited, the king's subjects will be richer for it. An opportunity missed by the two emperors. Relations between Rurik II's realm and the Japanese have never been higher, supposedly, and the king has decided the time has come to graciously reciprocate the good news that their investment have done for the people. In a speech later this month, Rurik II plans to make a special declaration of brotherhood between him and the Japanese emperor Hirohito. This declaration will be more than solidify the strong ties we've built with the sphere. It will show to the world that a time will come when the continent of Asia is dominated with the, between two great monarchs of equal importance and stature, Hirohito of Japan and Rurik II of Russia. We have no doubt that the Japanese will be flattened by his, or flattered by His Majesty's declaration. 
the Almighty Dollar. Now that the solid trade relations have been established with the OFM, we begin to reap the rewards. Our envoys in Washington, now firm partners with the Americans, will begin to make requests for the U.S. investments in Central Siberia. Our attempts at expanding the realm's infrastructure have, gone, have been going at a slower pace than the king would like, and he hopes that American aid will help tremendously towards getting the ball rolling. On top of our construction projects, some will need some much needed relief. These investments will continue to build up good relations between King Rurik II and the U.S. The Americans will be made to understand that working with our king will be within the best interests of both nations. A unitary Caribbean, huh? Still have a deficit, which does kind of suck, but, oh, national debt's quite high. But uh, then again, our growth is not bad. Inflation's been going down. We crown corporatism, huh? Born in the frozen land center of Siberia, crown corporatism is an economic system in which the economic output is decided by the crown sponsors of unions and corporations, a peculiar system coming from the just as peculiar principality of Kemerovo. It gives the workers' unions a great power in the economy, which helps to keep the Russian workers happy while simultaneously having good working conditions. Only tell and tell of such a system shall leave Russia, however. We're almost at 50% poverty rate. So close. Uh, research still is not bad. Agriculture is pretty good. Um, admin efficiency is... Oh God, I want to get it higher. Functional admin efficiency is really good to get. Really much better than what we currently have. Um, industrial expertise is okay. A letter to Japan. Following the request of his foreign ministry, uh, or minister, to send an official message of friendship to the Emperor of Japan, such a letter would help strengthen the bond between the two monarchs and open up a wide range of cooperation in the future, or so we've been told. As court members had attempted to hijack the writing of the declaration for themselves, however, he remained steadfast and made sure that all the work was genuine. He thought it was better to keep it uh, more authentic than diplomatic. Rurik found the start of his writing the hardest. He had no idea where to begin, let alone how to conclude the darn thing. Yet as that night went on, the bottle of his desk got emptier, and he realized that the words flowed with his pen with ease. By the time he scrawled his name at the bottom of the page, he was quietly impressed with his efforts. Such length and such style could have only been the work of his genius. He now bothered to reanalyze really what he wrote, and said he had sealed, sealed it and sent it right off and away. Baranowski was quite taken aback once he learned the news that the king had sent off the declaration without first requesting him to read over it. He might have complained, but he knew better than to question his royal highness's judgment. The foreign secretary knew that all he could do was hope. Let's hope for the best and invite American experts. Although our workforce is well on the road becoming quite capable on their own terms, it wouldn't help to help them along. America has long been renowned for its industrial prowess, and their experts are masters of the craft. It is fortunate that in His Majesty's diplomatic efforts to Washington have resulted in strong ties with the U.S., which opened several interesting avenues that were previously un unavailable to us. We can use our influence abroad and send invitations to various American specialists in the field of industry and economics to advise our workers and improve overall productivity throughout the realm with their invaluable assistance. Central Siberia can once again become the industrial backbone of Russia. 0.36 is not enough. The Red Twilight. If you don't worry about that, please go right ahead. Deficit, of course. One might attempt very tax high. We need more excise revenue, of course, but still. When do we get the next one? We have so much political power. We get almost roughly two a day. It's ridiculous. 0 0.44, 0 0.52, 0 0.08 a day. 0 0.07 some. 0 .07 some every day. It's not bad. They decline. Disappointing news from the diplomats in the U.S. Despite the best efforts of, of our diplomats, our diplomats, Americans decided to decline a request to make an investment in the economy. While they assure us they are still committed to remaining good relations, they claim that such an investment would not be within the best interest for now. God dang it. That's not the result we were expecting, of course, and may lead to the Royal Ministry of Foreign Affairs to suspect that dealing with Americans may be a waste of time. Only tell them to how the future diplomatic talks will go. Our disappointment is immeasurable, but in the halls of glory. It took a great, great deal of effort on the part of His Majesty, Diplomatic's Corps, but it looks like their efforts have paid off in the end, maybe. Although many are detained a certain degree of skepticism, our state is finally beginning to be begin taken seriously as a potential contender to Russian reunification, and her presence has been at least nominally recognized by much of the world's nations. Trade with the outside rules flourishing for the first seven decades, and Central Siberia is quickly becoming a hub for international commerce as more foreign businesses seek to make lucrative investments in our king's bountiful realm. Our first few steps into the world have so far been a success, and uh, the future of the Principality is looking bright indeed. Even more political power! But happened in 1968, everybody? Improve poverty? Nice, even better. Good, good, good. In the halls of glory, my friends. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, mechanized forces, which we're not going to use in this campaign, but whatever. American sends experts. Optimistic news have arrived from Washington today. Our request for support in the form of skilled industrial experts has not been answered, and the Americans have agreed to send some of the best available industrial minds uh, to aid with their industrialization efforts. They'll be arriving in the Central Siberia region soon, and we can expect they'll be working for almost immediately. Looking for work almost immediately. <clears throat> As another significant milestone in our efforts to maintain strong relations with the U.S., and they're willing to send some of their own people to aid with the development of our humble kingdom, who knows what kind of deals will we'll be open to in the future. Very good. And Mechanized Infantry Corps. Demonstrated time and time again since the Second World War, Mechanized Infantry Units supported by IFBs are without question the future of warfare. As part of the ongoing efforts to modernize the army, the King has begun a series of organizational reforms intending to finally bring the infantry into the 20th century by introducing mechanization. As an ideal vision, all of our infantry divisions are to ride into battle on APCs and overwhelm the enemy with their blistering speed of their attacks. No longer will His Majesty's troops slog it out on the foot, 
Horses tow their artillery with horses. Horses, this is a new age, and such ancient concepts simply won't cut it. Our military must embrace every modern innovation they can and become all the more effective for it. I apologize for these long videos. It's just that I want to get through this campaign quickly because I like it. I like this campaign quite a bit. Uh, King Rurik is, is a lot of fun to play, at, play as and play with. So, so much pee, pee I love it. The king's finest. The kingdom's finest. During our darkest nations, our nation's darkest moments came over. Our nascent military is forced to make compromises for the sake of getting more rifles out in the field to fight the king's many enemies. Now that all central Siberia has been united, the time for compromise is over. Our military must consist of the finest men and women in all of Russia, and to achieve this, Rook II proposed a significant tightening of the principality's recruitment and training standard. Furthermore, he also wishes to completely overhaul and modernize all of our current methods of training to create a more effect efficient system for recruiting the soldiers of tomorrow. Once these reforms are enacted, only the best will be available to fill the ranks, and the military will become a crack force of warriors and who are ready to do whatever it takes to defend the motherland. Screw it. We're going to use all these because we can. And we just got uh, higher foreign instructors as well and improved worker training too. Good. Expertise, good. Ooh, we're getting close. Yes. Fire relief, minus 0 0.41. Oh, so good. Just so good. And happy April now. Armor improvements? Um, uh, sure, why not? We'll be fun to come off helicopter design bureau first. Jets and the like are all well and good, but our Air Force still lacks helicopters to support our ground troops on the ground. These fearsome machines can perform a multitude of roles, from transport to ground attack missions, and have become an almost essential part of any modern Air Force. Fortunately, there is one man who could help us fill his gap. Nikolai Kamov is a brilliant engineer whose specialty is designing helicopters. His design bureau, sadly, was vastly underappreciated by the previous government of Central Siberia, and lacked the money needed to move forward with any kind of projects. Rurik II wishes to generously fund Kamov's bureau so that he may help us with designing cutting-edge, modern helicopters for our military. Still more of a deficit. Um, I don't want her to growth, but what if we were to do this? We have the political power for it. We get quite a surplus. We get 1% we get less real growth. And we, that was just shot up a whole bunch. Which is not great, but, you know, whatever. We'll see what we can do. Maybe it'll be good, maybe it won't be good. Of course, getting this one done is going to be... It's just so, so, so important. Rudimentary factory lines are going to be going, getting better factory complexes eventually, too. The Falcon's fleet. Our previous foes in Nova Siberia once commanded the most formidable air force in Siberia. With a fleet of aircraft that could rival even that of the free aviators, they caused us much headache during our bloody war to overthrow the corrupt Siloviki. Now that they've been defeated, their aircraft now sit unused in their extensive airfield, just waiting to be unleashed once again. It would be a waste to just leave all that valuable pre-war material to gather rust. As it happens, the principal is in need of an air force, and these planes and airfields could fulfill the king's needs quite confidently or conveniently. An effort shall be made to renovate these facilities and make sure that the planes are still in working condition. Soon we shall have a fearsome air force of our own. More debt, so be it. So be it. Oh, that's really hurting us really badly right now. Oh, well, not badly, but you know, it's not great. 64, not bad. Primary schooling. Modern research facilities. Beautiful. Ooh. How are we doing with construction of everything? Transfer plans are looking good. Almost a thousand, which is very decent. Uh, early fighters are coming along. Cast is coming along. It's not a lot, but it's still better than nothing. State welfare programs. Even better poverty, more reliability, and better poverty rate. Increase of GDP by 5% is very good as well. To rule the seas. Or skies. Finally, our own humble principality has an air force of its own. Now that we have a fully functioning air force, or air, air fleet, complete with newly designed helicopters courtesy of the Kamov Design Bureau, we have surpassed the old Nova Soviet government to become the true lords of the sky here in Siberia. Our planes will ensure the skies belong to King Rurik, while our helicopters will provide all kinds of exciting new opportunities for waging war, from lightning fast troop transport to raining hot death from upon the king's enemies, with such a dramatic advantage over our potential foes. Victory is all but assured. Oh, this is too awesome. Even more political power. I'm meeting with Kamov, though. A call had come at about midnight last night, but rousing Nikolai from sleep, expecting some manner of emergency, but instead hearing Rurik II himself on the other end. Apparently, Rurik had taken an interest in his work with the Kamov Helicopter Design Bureau, and wanted to meet him the very next day, around noon. After an exchange of niceties, Kamov put Rurik on hold while he scrambled in the wee hours of the morning to schedule a last-minute meeting with the king by the two. He failed to look or book any kind of meeting space at the bureau office, and said would be meeting Rurik at his workshop. This was why, at noon, Nikolai Kamov was putting his papers in order and a model on the t table in a dusty workshop to meet a gosh darn king in on ten hours of notice. Whereas right he made his last preparations, the door swung open and the old king hobbled his way in. Nikolai snapped to attention, but was quickly dismissed by Rurik at ease, friend. I'd like to keep this informal. All I need for you is to tell me about your wondrous flying machines. Nikolai raised an eyebrow at the term, but shrugged it off. The king had seen better days, surely, offering the king a treat, a seat. 
Nikolai began taking his highness through the workings of the Bureau's latest design. Rurik was friendly and cordial, but quite frankly confused as a craft, as well as expenses, where as explained almost every sentence the king asked something absurdly ignorant, but Nikolai humored his questions with slight annoyance. Then once done, awaited the king's response, who had been stroking his chin for the last few t minutes of the pitch. Fine work, young man, Rurik said to the nearly 70-year-old aeronautics engineer. Rurik smiled, smirked himself, watching Nikolai's bewilderment anyways. I think your bureau will be benefiting of some funding from the crown. I'd like to put a few million rubles into this project. What do you say? Nikolai lit up, lit up uh, drumming his fingers across the table with excitement at the prospect. Uh, uh, we would welcome it, sir. Anything else before you leave today? I think that'll be all good. Uh, well, that'll, that'll be all good luck with your flying machines, my friend. Seeing new designs? The Royal Army's troops are forced to make do with the vintage bolt action rifles, while the rest of the world has moved on to using fully semi automatic fully automatic assault rifles. And my portable weapons that can crack are both the heaviest tank and the fastest plane. This is unacceptable. His Majesty knows this too, and it's wisely tasked the R O R D with studying modern designs from all around the world. With some careful analysis and just a little bit of luck, our engineers will be able to present the military with advanced, but still robust designs that would be best serving your troops on a modern battlefield. Only the finest and most modern tools of for warfare will do for the king's armies. Yeah. Nice. Um, still in 1968. We do want to make sure we have got good enough artillery as well. Only 5% improvement is not much, but, you know, we'll take whatever we can grab, basically. Go with one for now. Maybe two in the future, but we'll see. Education, yes. No cost is too great for us. Surplus is still good. Growth is still good. The civilian spending is the most... Uh, the thing that's hurting us the most. Less than 50% poverty? Nice. Armor improvements. Our tank fleet is a fearsome force indeed, but without the necessary modernizations, they will be forced and useless in the coming wars. These vintage relics may have been dangerously effective on the battlefields of yesterday, but with the advance, uh, advent of heat, advanced heat warheads and improved man portable AT weapons, they simply will not stand a chance against their future enemies. Rook II's approach to Royal Office's research and development and stressed the necessity for a fully modern force of fighting vehicles. The ROROD has no, wasted no time in finding solutions to the problem of our advanced or outdated vehicles, and their ideas are quite promising. Higher pro powered Engines could carry our tanks and IFEs across the battlefield at unprecedented speeds, while experimental new designs of armor may just be able to reduce the danger posed by heat munitions. All that remains now is to put these theories into practice. Why not? Might as well. I've got all that stuff down. Let's go there, too. Ooh, we need uh, planes, too. Improving travels would be good. How many more days? We've got about a month left of that stuff. Minus point for seven. Drool the skies. Expand the arsenals. When we triumphed over our neighbors during the wars of Central Siberia, the king's forces managed to secure control over a significant, important munitions depot at Akaban. Abakan. The facility is one of the largest arsenals of weapons east of the Ural Mountains, and for now is yet to serve a purpose for us beyond taking everything we can carry. This is about to change. His Majesty has ordered the Abakan arsenal to be completely refurbished and expanded to become a fully fledged weapons produce production center once more. Once it's operational, the arsenal's expanded facilities will allow us to produce more equipment for the troops even faster than before, and will ensure that every man and woman in the King's army has a rifle and plenty of ammo at their disposal. Yes. Because his GDP even more? That's something I love. Good God. Interest rates are 6.942%. Not good. The pride of the King. King Rook's II's reforms are finally coming to a close, and so far they seem to have been a complete success. The Royal Army is now one of the most elite, well equipped armed forces in all of Russia, and will certainly cause our rivals to go green with jealousy. And with a formidable new air force to support our troops from, a, from the air, the inevitable wars don't look so bleak for us after all. Some smaller minds would consider Rook's the style of governance to be antiquated, but nobody can deny that his newly reformed military is anything but. The principle of these armed forces are now a highly advanced, modernized force, entirely capable of slugging it out with the best of the best. All that remains now is to put their new armies to the ultimate test, to victory. But Bigger and better. I trust this design is to your liking, Your Majesty. Rurik's eye, the blueprint performed carefully, detailed within was an improved, modernized model of the tried and tested T-55 main battle tank. Something about it, however, wasn't quite shaping up to the king's eyes. This looks adequate. <clears throat> Uh, adequate? What do you mean? The designer maintained a courteous smile, but there was evidence of exasperated panic in his voice. Well, it's not very different from the old model, is it? All you did was fix up the engine. Uh, when you should be thinking bigger. I want you to see if you can fit a bigger gun and more armor on this thing. Uh, well, for all due respect, Your Majesty, but that wouldn't be very uh, practical for us at the moment. Tanks in this day and age tend to rely on speed rather than brought force in. Still, the king put a firm hand on his designer's shoulder, and he felt as though his heart stopped for a small instant. Oh, nonsense. You're going to put more armor and more firepower on it, and you're going to make it work. Stop worrying about minute details and work with the same ethic that built this kingdom. If I was able to get this far without compromising favor of practicality, so can you. The designer gulped. What the king was asking before was not within his design bureau's content means, but who was he to turn down the royalty? Yes, Your Majesty, I'll, I'll try my best. I'll try. We've got two more focuses to do, and then we'll call an episode for a very, very quite long episode.
Or maybe just longer than normal. Re really just longer than normal. Let's do that. Start working on some of the improved anti-air stuff. Uh, basic artillery is what we're going to need to keep. Civilian trains are fine. We should probably get some armor trains as well. And it's almost 1969. It's almost perfect for us. We'll go to war with these guys and kill them all off. We got a lot of transport planes, which is awesome. I keep forgetting to change it and get the special forces stuff done. We're over poverty. More, minus 0.45. That is just so good. It's just so good. Mm -hmm. Seven. Not much there. Agriculture's getting faster. A tank, a fit, uh, a tank fit for a king. The second look on with childlike glee as a new and improved model of the T-55 rumbled onto the proving grounds. Despite the design bureau's excuses and objections, Rurik's ideal modifications had made it into the final draft, and now his creation was coming to life before his eyes. As he had requested, the vehicle was equipped with a larger 115mm gun and rather characteristic car com composite armor up kits alongside the turret. The king turned to his son with a smile on his face. Do you see this, Boris? I told you to make my tank. Go look at it. Boris Krylov was much more reserved. It was quite an impressive vehicle, Father, but aren't you concerned about the added price? The new additions aren't going to exactly be cheap. This again, those metal boxes are already ludicrously expensive as it is. A few more rubles aren't going to kill us. Rurik said, turning back to the view of the tank be put through the spaces. If you say so, anyway, on a more pleasant note, I've heard the tankers already beginning this thing a nickname. As Majesty's eyebrows, they call it. Huh. Rurik began to laugh. The name was no doubt referring to the bulky armored kits on the turret. Ha, huh, isn't that something? My legacy, she, my legacy, my legacy shall live on. Even in the form of a tracked war machine. Only the best for armored fleets. I'll keep looking at this, man. Oh, it went down actually a little bit, which is actually kind of nice. Debt is 11.37 billion. As long as you keep working it down, that would be the most important thing. Mass mechanization. Good and modern agriculture would be better. Doesn't help us that much, but it does help us no matter what. There. Let me just go first. There you go. Radar doesn't help that much, but you know what? Every little bit helps. The rule of skies. Nice. More air detection defense. Oh. Oh, they're actually not going to kill each other. They're just going to kill the smaller states. Interesting. Don't want to forget, don't want to forget, don't want to forget. Thunder on a clear day. Igor took a sip of his coffee, taking the quaint peacefulness of the moment. Here he was, sharing a quiet morning in a sleepy Novosibirsk cafe with the love of his life, Natasha. Her fluffy, garish, garishly embroidered garments made her appear all the more ravishing on this fine day. Did you read the paper this morning, Igor, she asked, finishing a sip of her own? They say the price of petrol is going up. <clears throat> I'm glad we don't have to drive everywhere, but what about the folks who don't live in the city? Igor cleared his throat as he brought this cup to his mouth. I'm sure they'll be alright. It's not like cars and whatnot are very common here anyway. We've got a lot of catching. Suddenly, an incredibly loud roar filled the room, startling Igor and causing him to lose his grip on the cup. Effing heck, he yelped as a scalding hot liquid uh, splashed onto his lower torso. Shoving the chair back, Igor quickly grabbed a tissue from the table and cursed under his breath as he began to wipe himself down. Natasha found herself sniffling a giggle. You need to be more careful, Igor. What was that sound anyways? The cacophonous roar was so audible, albeit getting much quieter as the second passed. Uh, Igor tossed the so soggy tissues aside and looked, took a peek outside the cafe's front window. In the distance, a trio of jet fighters, uh, or fighter jets, were soaring up into the horizon. That's a gosh darn air force again. Why do we have to move somewhere so close to a military base anyways? Do they have to fly so low? And the answer, of course, is yes. Yes, they do. We might have to raise, uh, get more taxes eventually, too. Good. Uh, let's keep working on this up right now. It's fine. And read about the pride of the king of Rook's triumph. Less than 49% uh, poverty rate. Not bad. Reunification Russia. We have to wait till uh, 69. So in a few months. And I'll do probably all that stuff off screen. Just because. Why not? These guys are all thick. Relatively thick. Rook Shrine. Has anyone seen the king? He was supposed to be here three hours ago. Yuri felt himself breaking into a cold sweat as he scanned the balcony for signs of his father. A massive military parade was being held in the capital today, but the guests of honor yet to show up. This isn't the first time he's been late, Yuri, Princess Lady called out to her brother. There's no need to panic. I'm sure he'll turn up at some point. Yuri continued frantically pacing, undeterred by his sister's words. No, he's been late before, but not this late. Where the heck is he? Sit down and stop worrying, Yuri. You're going to miss a parade, Boris Krylov pleaded to his brother as a loud rumbling became audible from the streets. I think the armored units are rolling out. Now look! Yuri turned his attention to the road below, where a column of tanks were making their way down the street. In front of the column was a particularly colorful and ornately decorated tank, and a familiar figure standing on top of the hatch, gleefully waving his arms. The prince's eyes widened as he realized who it was. The prince gave a sigh of relief and felt a cautious smile overtake his face as Rook's second turned to wave at him and the rest of the spectators on the balcony. He really has gone mad, hasn't he? Yuri said under his breath. Deep down, he wouldn't have had it any other way. His majesty leads, and we will follow. Which looks really great. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. We want to reunify as much of Russia as possible. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.